Hi everyone, and welcome to this video where we look at a member of my classic computer collection. And today we're going to have a look at an example of an 8-bit Japanese microcomputer, one that was sold into the high end of the business market prior to the dominance of the IBM PC and its clones. It is the Panasonic JD850M. So let's check it out. After receiving intelligence reports at a European conference in 1980, Jack Trammell, the then owner and founder of Commodore Computers, famously warned the US computer industry that the Japanese were coming and to be prepared for a flood of high quality machines at value for money prices. Japan never really broke into the North American market, but Trammell's comments may have been referencing machines like the Panasonic JD850M. Prior to the dominance of the IBM PC and its clones, from about 1983 onwards, Japanese manufacturers had a small but steadily growing export market for business computers, many of which found themselves put to work in New Zealand and Australia. Here's the front cover from a brochure advertising the Panasonic JD850M. It's a glamorous image, which belies the fact that most business machines of the era spend 99% of their time doing very mundane and unglamorous tasks, such as account ledgers and stock control. Here's the Panasonic JD850M sitting on my workbench in the computer shack. If you think it looks like a beast, you'd be right. It is. The machine is huge and heavy. I'd estimate around 22 kilograms or so. It was a hazardous mission to get it up the stairs to this room, even though it was in its original box. I acquired the machine quite accidentally and at no cost apart from pickup. The owner was about to dump it. My initial thoughts were just to store it and pass it on in the future. But after seeing it work and noticing that it was in museum quality condition, I decided to keep it. Now, some quick facts about it. It dates from 1982, runs that venerable 8-bit business operating system, CPM, is powered by an 8085A CPU, and has two 8-inch floppy disk drives. It's the only computer in my collection that has drives of this size. Along with the computer, I also got a stack of 46 8-inch disks with accounting and stockkeeping software and data. These disks are huge. Here's a photo showing a comparison of the 8-inch disks with their smaller cousins, the 5 and a quarter inch and 3 and a half inch floppy. You know, I used to think that these 8-inch disks were totally redundant once 5 and a quarter inch floppies came on the scene, but I was wrong. What I didn't realise was that in 1981-82, 8-inch floppies held a lot more data than comparable 5 and a quarter inch floppies. For example, these double-sided disks, coupled with the double-density capability of this machine, means they hold almost a megabyte of data. Later 5 and a quarter inch disks had the machines and the capability to hold close to or exceeding this amount, but in 1981-82, most of these smaller diskettes held far less than that, typically 90k to 180k. Indeed, a hard disk drive of the time only held 5 to 10 megabytes. With serious business machines of this era then, the large disks were a distinct advantage. So here's a look inside. This is a couple of side views of these large drives with a coverall. They're certainly impressive pieces of equipment. Here is a look at the bits and pieces around the tube. Here you can see the PSU at the back, and note also the fan. A machine like this would have been on for long periods of time as records were being processed, so a fan was necessary. Here's a shot of the back where you can see part of the PSU and over on the left note the circuit board for the disk drives. Also the shot shows you the ports at the back. From left to right there is a keyboard connector, an expansion port and there are three DB25 serial ports. One of these would have been for a printer. There's no parallel port on this machine. Here is a shot of the back of the drives. Getting to the circuit board was easier than I had expected and it was just a matter of tilting the machine forward so it was resting on its face, then removing the bottom plate. Main board was there underneath. Now something to note on this main board is the large bank of 32 2K4116 RAM chips soldered onto the board. Had this model come out a year or two later, 
I'm sure these would have been replaced with eight 4164 ICs. Here's another shot of the board at an angle. It's a neat and tidy arrangement that is very accessible for servicing. Finally, we come to the keyboard. There's lots of function keys up the top. But an interesting thing about the keyboard is that it lacks an escape key. Also, I couldn't find a reset button anywhere on the machine. There may be a combination of keys you can use, but if there is, I, I didn't discover it. There doesn't seem to be any way to reset the machine other than switching it off. If anyone knows an easier way to reset these machines, please let me know. So, time to fire the machine up and see it working. So, it's a matter of switching it on and inserting the very large 8.5 inch disc into the slot and waiting. Doesn't take long, and suddenly we've got CPM version 2.2 booting up on the screen. And you can see there that the first thing it does is to list the assignments to those function keys on the keyboard. I've just typed DIR for directory, and now that's listing the files that are on that CPM disk. They're all the normal sort of CPM files, along with extra ones for various uh, features and functions. It's got mBasic and it's got compiled basic as well on the disk. So this is Microsoft Basic, uh, the interpreter that I've just fired up. Now basic was used a lot in these machines. In fact the accounting packages that I got with this unit, they were written in basic. And in fact so were many of the programs that were around for business and also many games at that time. I'm just writing a small loop here in basic basic so you can see it working, get an idea of the speed of the machine or at least uh, as it goes through interpreted basic, how fast it is. Keyboard's really nice to use, it's got a, a good definite feel to it, sort of keyboard that you could type on uh, for some time and not feel aggrieved about it. Just coming to the end of our little bit of script here, so we'll run it, and you can see it there printing out the name JD850M a hundred times. So you can see it doesn't take that long. So we'll get out of BASIC and return to the operating system by typing system, gets us to the A prompt, and I'll run another program that I found on this boot disk, and this is Colossus Cave. Now Colossus Cave, for those of you that don't know about it, it was, a, was the original adventure game and it originated on mainframes. It's all text based and the idea is that you explore this underground cavern and have all sorts of adventures. And uh, I was really pleased to find this game on this machine. I know it had been ported from the mainframes onto the CPM environment and I've seen it on other uh, CPM machines. I was really pleased to find it here. Microsoft put out a version of this with the IBM PC as, as part of the package with that particular machine that went on sale. Had the system disk been a five and a quarter inch one rather than an eight inch disk, I'm sure this game wouldn't have been on it because it does take up a bit of room and system disks of those of that era, 1981, 82, usually could only fit the system files on the disk and other associated DOS files, there was almost no room for anything else, which is why it was very common to have a two floppy disk drive system, simply because you couldn't fit your, do your disk operating system, your programs and your data all on just the one disk. So if you'd been watching the screen here, you would have seen I've uh, entered a building and I was standing beside and I picked up a few uh, objects keys, a lamp, to help us with our adventure. Just so you can see these big drives in action, I'll do a disk to disk copy from disk 1 to, to disk 2. Disk 2 actually has a copy of CPM on it already, but I'll just overwrite it with the contents of disk 1. There's a small utility called vCopy which you can use to do this. So I'll start that up and it simply does a track by track copy so you can see it working there writes a few tracks into memory from disk 1 and then from memory writes the contents onto disk 2 as this occurs the track numbers appear on the screen 
there are 77 tracks on these large 8 inch discs and if it copies all 77 of them without an error the disc copy is successful. As I mentioned I did get some software with the machine mainly business accounting packages I'll just show you a few of these I won't go into them too much but just the main menus they're all written in basic and they load automatically so it's very easy for the operator they don't have to interact with CPM at all you just need to put the disk in as it boots so here's one that simply holds transactions and other records you can see the menu items there here's another one this is uh, for a higher purchase system there's the main menu for that particular package now all these packages assume that there's a printer attached to the machine and in fact a printer did come with the machine here it is it's a huge beast a C Ito printer and these were common models back say 1981-82 they are dot matrix printers now, this one's a, a wide one so it, it can take wide uh, fan form paper to print things like bills and accounts they're very noisy and they're very heavy and very large but certainly they were part and parcel of a business computer of the day they were also very expensive so if you'd outlaid something like four thousand New Zealand dollars for a computer you'd probably have to outlay something like a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars for a printer as well so they they really added to the cost there's a shot of the label and the model number and here's a shot with the cover off so this is what you needed to do if you went to change the ribbon so we'll just finish off with a quick look at the manuals there's three main ones and you can see they're in these ring binders so they deal with the accounting or the business software it's largely record keeping records of transactions records of higher purchase records of stock and all three manuals are pretty much the same uh, they're very light on diagrams so they do have sample printouts and if you manage to wade through instructions you can figure out how to use the packages but this is what people would uh, have had to do in the day this is our high purchase one so nothing too fancy nothing too flash nothing particularly interesting which perhaps fits in to the type of no-nonsense software it is So what are my final thoughts on the Panasonic JD850M? Well I'm glad I've got it in my collection. It wasn't a machine that I was seeking and you, you couldn't call it a classic computer but I think the, the line of machines or at least the, the computing technology it represents uh, that is high quality, top end uh, business computing prior to the days when the IBM PC and clones became dominant as a representation of that class of machine it's a pretty good one it's the only machine I've got with the 8 inch drives it's huge and it's heavy but it just speaks of quality so as a collection piece it's good to have so I hope you enjoyed that look at the Panasonic JD850M so until the next video keep well and we'll see you then